smiling faces that have come to join us in the house of the Lord. This morning's message I've entitled, Your Talk Reflects Your Life. You think of a lot of ways to say that. The truth is that what comes out of your mouth determines to other people and people around you exactly who you are. And the story comes to us from the, the Gospel of Matthew, the 15th chapter, the, first, the 10th through the 20th verses. That's what Jesus told us, though. What goes into your mouth is not what makes you unclean. What makes you unclean is what comes out of your mouth. There are <coughs> icons in the world that remind us, with and without words, of who God is to us. I'm thinking of a thought that I want you to go with me to Jerusalem, and just outside of the city gates is a place where there was where capital punishment was always taking place. They call it Calvary, the hill of the skull. It is because it had ruts that were dug into it that from a distance made it look like a human skull with the eyes and the opening for the mouth. And at the top of that is where Jesus was crucified. 
and we remember that affectionately known as Calvary because it brings to our hearts and minds not the punishment that Jesus received, but the sacrifice that Jesus made. And so as we started Turning Point and we were moving the earth around to make sure that the building would sit flat and we'd have a retention pond in the back to collect the excess water, we had our own Calvary left over. We had a choice of smoothing it out and turning it into a softball field, but we decided, let's leave it. We'll put crosses at the top of it. We'll make it a reminder of what Jesus did for us, the sacrifice that, that Jesus made. And so if in your mind you have a picture of Calvary, off in a distance with the crosses on the top, and then as you're walking out this morning, or as you walked in this morning, or if you're sitting by our window and you look out at Calvary, you can hardly see the crosses because weeds have taken over. Big weeds. They used to be little tiny things. Now they're growing into the cedars of Lebanon. <laughs> now, not too long ago, that was a problem. So some of our faithful decided they were going to burn it down. And they caught it on fire and they caught themselves on fire and they burned their feet and they it was an issue and the fire started racing to the different sides and the horses next door were twiddling their thumbs wondering how far we would let the fire go a couple of weeks ago tom gordon came to me and he said you know the weeds are taking over calvary and I said, well, we probably ought to take a day and see if we get some volunteers. We'll just pull them out. He said, I tried that. He said, I got down and I grabbed them by the, the trunk of that weed and I tried to pull it out. But the roots have gone in so deep you can't get them out. So now I spend my nights dreaming about taking the boat anchor off of my boat, attaching it to the lawnmower, <laughs> throwing it up on the hill and dragging them down. But the roots have gone so deep that it changes the whole original plan I think that God had for Calvary give us an impression, to give us a reminder, and now not only do we have melted spotlights, but we have weeds that are almost engulfing the whole of the three crosses. It's like that with us too. I think that we come looking our best on Sunday. I mean, we're an informal church, but I bet we look as good today as we're going to look all week long. But without care and practice, the weeds of our lives will grow without us noting, noticing it and paralyze who we are becoming, where we're going, and what we say to other people. Their weeds take over in our world. And if we don't remain cautious and careful, they'll take over our lives as well. Because, see, once the weeds dig in, question is, how do we rid ourselves of them? I'm going to share with you this morning the gospel message out of the 15th chapter of Matthew, but we're going to use the J.P. Phillips version. Verses 10 through 20. And then he called the crowd to him and said, Listen and understand this thoroughly. It is not what goes into the mouth that makes him common or unclean. It is what comes out of one's mouth that makes them unclean. And later, his disciples came to him and said, Do you know that the Pharisees were deeply offended by what you said? And Jesus responded to them, Every plant which my heavenly Father did not plant will be pulled up by the roots. Let them alone. They are blind guides. And when one blind man leaves another blind man, they will both end up in a ditch. Explain this parable to us, broken Peter. Are you still unable to grasp things like that, replied Jesus? Don't you see that whatever goes into the mouth passes through the stomach and then out of the body altogether? But the things that come out of a man's mouth come from his heart and mind. 
and it is they that really make them unclean. For it is from a man's mind that the evil thoughts arise, murder, adultery, lust, theft, perjury, and blasphemy. These are the things which make a person unclean, not eating without washing your hands properly. You see, the leaders of the church were upset because the disciples of Jesus didn't wash their hands before they ate. That they had worked that into the rule system that said that makes you unclean, unfit for worship. I know that you, like myself, have been overwhelmed with what's going on in our world, what's going on in our nation. And every time I turn on the television, I, I see the events that are going on in my, my stomach turns. I see young people of our nation fighting each other because they think differently about important things and sometimes, to me, irrelevant things. Some of the things they're doing, I think, back us up in history hundreds of years. But even more upsetting than what they're doing is what's coming out of their mouth. Ignorant dialect is being used to communicate between each other. And it's become a matter of fact in, in our world today. It's become part of the way we communicate with each other. Bad language, lies, intentional deception have become routine in the methods of how we communicate with each other and to the world. When I was young, my father, who I never heard swear, not once in my entire, in his entire life, said to me, foul language is a sign of ignorance. People use words like that because they're not intelligent enough to articulate what they're trying to share. And I agreed with him, and I went back to my room and looked up articulate. <laughs> Even Jesus rebuked the potty mouth of his day. It all started with an accusation that Jesus and his band broke the tradition of of being clean and unclean. What they were talking about and what Jesus was talking about are two really separate things. They said, if you don't wash your hands, you're unclean. Jesus said, it's about spiritual cleanliness. That your hands don't make you dirty, but your mouth and your actions do. And an unclean mouth is certainly worse in every situation than unclean pinkies. So here's how Jesus explained it. It's the biological truth that we won't dwell on. He says if it goes in here, it comes out into the sewer. But if it starts here and it comes out like the sewer, we have a problem. Because it, what's in your heart reflects what's in your mind. And if what's in your mind is unclean, it will come out of your body as unclean. Think it or do it. It's either right or wrong from inception. These are the real wrongs we commit to each other and to God. Uh, there's a place in the Bible where Jesus talks on the Sermon on the Mount and he talks about if you think it, it is you. So if you think of adultery and lying and deceit and thinking it is like doing it. <clears throat> to God, you see, cleanliness is not an external problem. Cleanliness to God is an internal problem. And the rigidity of the pharaohs, uh, the pharaohs, the Pharisees, the rulers of the church of his day, their strict rules led them down a path of no return. They were so concerned about other people's hands, they couldn't identify the filth, the filth of their hearts. 
and where the world was taking them and where they were taking the world. So the question comes now, after we hear what Jesus said and what we see what the world was doing around them, what is the basis for right or wrong? What is your, your guideline for doing right or, or wrong? Do you have categories that you place things in? We talked about it many times before that it's just a little untruth certainly is different than murder and robbery and any of the big things. But that's not the way God sees things. God sees them things that the little things can paralyze you just as the big things do. Because sometimes we are paralyzed in an overdose of tolerance. Drowning in trying to figure out what is politically correct, what's socially correct. How should we address the problem? But we're thinking politically and socially, not godly. Because God sees what's in our heart and mind and how that comes out to the world. Jesus was probably the most loving and accepted person that has ever walked the earth. He dined with sinners. He ate with tax collectors. He was in the presence of the sick and the despaired. He worked among the poor as well as the pitiful. But Jesus never let anyone get away from him without knowing the difference between right and wrong. It was part of who he was. It was part of his outreach ministry. Jesus based his tenderness in a tough-minded certainty about the presence of the great wrongs and the crying need from the world to be right. So how do we change wrong to right? Well, I found a little story that might help you understand a way that you could apply to most anything. It was the high school principal's nightmare. The fad was that the girls of the school were putting a lot of lipstick on and then leaving lipstick lip prints on the mirror in the girls' bathroom. And it was getting out of hand. It was like, now there's more. Now there's more. And it was causing the janitor there to really spend a lot of time. And so he announced to the school, look, this is not right. Is it? It's probably spreading germs. Let's Let's not do this, but it didn't matter what he said, it continued. So finally he decided, I'm going to nip this in the bud. He calls the girls all together, and they all crammed into this one girl's restroom, and, and, and he invited the janitor to come with, with him. And he says, you know, I'm worried that this is not safe for you, healthy for you, as well it's hard for us to keep your, your school clean. He says, so I just want you to understand how hard the job is to clean up your unclean. Bob, Bob was the janitor. Bob, would you just show them how hard it is to clean the lipstick off of the mirrors? And Bob says, okay. And he walks into the first stall and he takes the toilet bowl brush out and he gets out there and he starts scrubbing, <laughs> scrubbing the mirror. <laughs> Problem solved. If it were only so easy to clean up our world, if it was so only so easy to clean up our own mouths, I'm going to ask you a question because today is about words, things we say, ways we communicate. I asked Sharon to find a song to play before my message. And I asked her to play it without words. Do an instrumental. Can you tell me the name of the song and who's, who sang it? By the Bee Gees. No. Not that no, one. Not that Before one. the message. <laughs> what I say. What I say. Richard who's, who, I heard somebody say, who sang it? Ray Charles. Ray Charles sang What I Say. Now, can you 
imagine why I had her play it without words. Some of the words might lead you to believe it would, was not something that should be played in, in church. But let me tell you the background of that, of that song. Ray Charles had played almost every song that he even knew in a concert, and they were clapping for more. And so he said to his band, follow my lead. And it came from church. And they call it call and response style. That the churches, primarily the black churches in those days, that's the way they preached. I'll say it, you repeat it. I'll say it, you repeat it. Call and response. I have um, three pages of the lyrics to this song, and almost all of it is, tell me what I say, tell me what I say, tell me what I say right now. You see, it's call and response. When I brought it up in our worship design, Sharon goes, oh, that's a bad song. See the girl with the diamond ring? Yeah. She was so touchy. She can do the Birdland all night long. What is the Birdland? Jolly Parker. Actually, you're really close. He said Charlie Parker. Charlie Parker is one of the greatest jazz. Charlie Parker. And Call him the bird. The bird, but it comes from the Birdland Jazz Nightclub in New York City where Charlie Parker played. She could enjoy the music in the club all night. That's not exactly what I thought he was singing. <laughs> what I say is what Jesus said because what you say will determine who you are. Yeah. Yeah. One more little tidbit on that, which I thought was pretty neat. It was his first gold record. And in 2002, it was introduced into the Rolling Stones' top 500 greatest songs of all times. What I say? Do those kinds of things, the Bee Gees and Ray Charles, belong in church? Only, maybe, only if it's an example of how words influence our society and how they influence us. Jesus makes it very clear that our words and our actions are products of who we are. Proof positive of what's inside of us comes out here first. That's why his Sermon on the Mount shocked everyone who was there and hearing it. And once again, when he said, if you think it, you've done it. God has a solution. You see, Created me a clean heart is what God does for a living. He offers to you a clean heart inside of you to change who you could be in this world to who you can be in his kingdom. And then he says, all things old will pass away. We must walk our talk. We must talk our faith. We must... Focus on the Holy Spirit within us. Being a child of God is not just a title. It's an, an intentional lifestyle choice. Practice makes us stronger. That's why God created the body of Christ, the church. He put Jesus at the head of the body of, of, of Christ, the church. So that we would get to practice what God has been preaching since the birth of the universe. Embrace the King of Kings. Celebrate the Lord of Lords. Because what you walk and what you talk 
reveals your total commitment. And all the children say, Amen. What I say? Amen.